Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Remote Real Estate Investor. My name is Emil Shore, and today I'm joined by Michael Album. And we're going to be interviewing another Michael, Michael Zuber, who you guys might be familiar with. He was on another episode we did, I believe it was episode 11, and it was a great conversation, really smart guy, and we wanted to bring him back for another episode. In case you guys don't know him, he's the author of a book called One Rental at a Time, which I highly recommend you read. I often cite it as one of my favorite real estate investing books. All right, let's jump in. Michael, Michael Zuber, I should say, welcome back to the show. We're excited to have you again. Yeah, this this should be fun. I always I love talking real estate, love helping people. So that's what you do, and I, I'm glad to partner on another podcast. It sounded like the guys were telling you that your last episode, which if people missed that one, that was episode 11. That was like a hit. I still get messages from people saying I love the Michael Zuber episode. So I'm excited, and I think we're gonna have you as a regular. Hopefully, we get you on like every other month to come and chat with our listeners and us. I'll be there anytime you ask. I really do enjoy this topic. Awesome. So for people who are not familiar with you, can you give us the quick summary rundown of who you are and your story? Yeah. Essentially, my story goes like this. I wasted my 20s earning a bunch of money and spending it all. I bump into rich dad, poor dad (laughs) at 30 years old, realize I'm a complete idiot. I spend the next 15 years busting my butt during the day working a tech job. But I start sacrificing, living below my means, and we start building a real estate portfolio. One rental at a time starts with houses. You know, I started investing long before the last crash. So a lot of the stuff we're kind of in the mix of now I've seen before. We moved out of houses into apartments. Then the crash comes, all the banks say no. We find a way to keep growing. Ultimately, we retired my wife and I retire replacing two six-figure incomes on rental properties. And you know she's been out for about five years and I left February 1st of 2018 and haven't looked back. Just enjoy this topic. Enjoy helping people see what's possible. I love your story. And your book, I, I refer back to it all the time, One Rental at a Time. I think everyone who's listening should go read it. It's such a, it's a great story. I think a lot of other books I've read, you know, they don't get into the story as much and like, mm-hmm the different challenges that arise throughout someone's investing career. And I love that you tackled those. So definitely recommend people go check that out. Yeah, I appreciate that because I, it's not a how-to book, right? You know, I don't, it's not a how-to book. It is literally what I said. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it changed my life. Here's a 15-year journey, which, oh, by the way, happens to correspond to a crazy real estate cycle, both boom and bust. You know, lots of mistakes are included. And ultimately success, but it was 15 years, one at a time, you know, some good days, some bad days. And, you know, the book is really meant to create belief and confidence in people. I really hate that I see a lot of people out there working to build a nest egg and then they give it to someone else. And in real estate, that's often called a syndication. I want more people to learn their market and, you know, in this case, come to Roofstock and, you know, make a selection, right? Bet on yourself. Don't you know, take 50 grand and give it to some schmuck who because he has a big YouTube or yeah, YouTube presence. (laughs) That's just stupid. There are so many things that you just said that I want to touch on that I agree with. One, I think, especially within the academy, I talk to a lot of people about, you know, building a passive income portfolio and hitting X dollar amount in passive income. And they're like, oh, there's no way I could ever do that. You know, well, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but in a year from now at 10, you know, 15, you're living proof that it is possible And it took you 15 years to get there. So Mm -hmm. I love that. And then as far as the syndication stuff, I think that's so interesting because I think a lot of people use that as a crutch, right? I want to invest in real estate, but I don't want to go do the hard work to get there. And so I love that advice of, hey, just go learn the market. Yeah. You only have to learn one. You know, learning a market is a skill. It's researching. I talk and teach all the time about if you learn your market and let's just, I don't know, pick a market like Fresno, where I am, right? It produces a 6% return and you can calculate it. It's easy math. Then your job is to go find seven and eight percent yields. That's it. And sometimes the market's crazy, like today. The market today is the strangest I've seen in 20 years. The Mm. supply of affordable housing is 30 or 40 percent below what I am used to. And the demand is high. And we're competing with owner occupants that can get mortgages now with a two on it, right? My first mortgage on investment was almost eight percent. So it's a very odd time. This is a time to learn a market, 
educate yourself, build confidence, because it could change in a heartbeat come later this year or next year. I'm not saying it will. I'm just saying it could. This is the time to learn, 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 learn. There was, I think it was maybe a Warren Buffett quote or something, but he talks about, you know, if you're not confident to go execute in a strong economy, there's no way you're going to feel confident to go execute in a weak economy. Oh, that is, I mean, yeah, I I had not heard that one from Warren Buffett, but he's so right. If you were to ask me my best time to buy was 2010. 2010, we were buying houses for land value or less. And there were like literally houses on them. It wasn't just lots. <laughs> and <laughs> nobody was buying. It was crazy. You know, right after, you know, that financial company went out, Bear Stearns, I think. And it was a weird time. And it wasn't hard to find. They were in the MLS. Like any price accepted, make an offer, must sell today. <laughs> like all capital letters. It's like, okay, well, I can write an offer and I'll write an offer half of list and you know, all that stuff. So our busiest year was 2010 and just nobody was around. It was just nobody. So yeah, I agree with you. Did people think you were crazy in 2010? Like for going and buying real estate when it was kind of bottoming out? They did when they, if they just heard, right? If they just heard, hey, Michael and Olivia, Olivia is my wife's name, just bought another house. They thought we were crazy until they realized, you know what? That was our 100th or 105th unit. Then they're like, oh, they must be doing something, right? But yeah, one of the reasons I still go to real estate meetups and I agree to talk is I want to see what the audience is doing. Because yes, I'll talk on any topic they ask me to, but I always leave like 20 minutes of questions. And why I want this is I want the questions. And all the questions in 2019, you're either a first time wholesaler or you were a syndicator who had never done a deal. And and that's all I heard about. I'm like, oh, we're near the peak. And I used that signal to sell 50 units of apartments in 19. So I have a bunch of cash ready to deploy if the market turns. So I've danced through raindrops twice. We sold housing at the peak in 05, 06, and we sold apartments at the peak in 2019. So if you learn your market and you look every day, I've been doing it 20 years and I still look every day. I look before this call. And looking doesn't mean buying. Looking just says, what's going on? What's new? What came off? What's been price dropped? What came back on? It takes 20 minutes. Everybody can do it. The key is you can't do 17 different markets. You can't do 15 different types of real estate. Pick one. And for most of the people watching this, your most important thing to do during the day is work nine to five or eight to six or whatever it is. So find 20 minutes before or after work to change your future. And you don't have to grow a portfolio to the size of mine. If you got to four or eight or 10, you're going to fundamentally change your life forever. And that should be good enough. If you want more, great. There's nothing wrong with four. Four is awesome. I love that. I think, you know, keeping your finger on the pulse is so important because now you recognize change. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're all over the place, like you're mentioning, you're not going to see it because you're not as involved. You're not, you know, embedded in that market, so to speak. So you mentioned something, Michael, about how this is the strangest real estate market you've seen in 20 years. Yeah. And curious to know, I mean, from everything that I've seen, I've experienced, everyone talks about, you know, we're at the top of the market in 19. And now COVID's hit, and now there's this kind of impending, Hmm. kind of built up friction, but nothing I've seen really happen yet. Rates have dropped, but I haven't seen the prices come down like people were anticipating. What are you seeing? What are you anticipating? Obviously, without a crystal ball. Yeah, again, yeah, just, just one guy's opinion. I only know one market in any detail, but I think there's a couple of things that are very clear. There are sub markets everywhere. First and foremost, what I can already see happening in vertical cities, right? San Francisco, New York. LA, right? Anywhere that's, that has towers, what we're seeing is space is good. So you're seeing class A tenants, which are always supposed to be the safest apartments to own. They're leaving because they have financial backing. They have a little nest egg. And they finally realize that, you know what? I don't want to live somewhere where I got to touch an elevator that, you know, 1,700 other people have touched. I want a backyard for my kids. I want an extra room for my office. And, you know, frankly, if this health crisis has taught us space is good. So that's happening. San Francisco is going to be a totally different city in a year. It's going to be, it's going to be tent city. It's going to be, it's going to be disgusting. Like it was for me in the eighties and I've lived here 50 years. So I remember when San Francisco wasn't the shining star, it's it's going to go back the other way, unfortunately. So verticals out, that is already happening. Class A is not the safe place to be in major metros. The other thing we're seeing is suburban flight. It's already happening kind of localized, right? In the Bay area, you know, it's East Bay, that kind of stuff. But what's really going to happen if the companies like Twitter and JP Morgan and all these others continue to say, live wherever you want, 
which I'm not convinced they will. They are certainly saying it now, but if they're still saying that in January, February, we're going to get the mass exodus from New York and California because of high taxes, right? California's state tax is 13.3%. I go three hours away to Nevada, it's zero, right? Eventually, people are going to make those kinds of decisions. So, you know, this will fundamentally change the landscape. There will be states like New York and California who struggle for a decade, probably, because they're going to be losing tax revenue and they're going to be having to cut services and people. And it's just going to be a different state, I think, for New York and California. So, and then the last thing we're seeing is jumbo loans. Jumbo market is really turned off. Even if you're a Silicon Valley RSU IPO kind of stuff, it's hard to get a jumbo loan today. So that market, especially if you're out in the suburbs, is slowing down like Fresno. That's the one part of the market that's building inventory. But that leaves conventional, right? Sub-jumbo, affordable, good quality, FHA, passable properties. That stuff is on fire. I mean, like fire. There was a house I was interested in that just the other day for $199. My model said I could have paid $170 for it, so $169. It was bid up to $219 because an owner-occupant could come in with 3.5% down. They can overpay. My number one competitor, what I look at all the time, is the consumer. It's because if they are, they're either fearful or greedy. And if they're greedy, they're going to overpay, because again, what's 3.5% of 200 grand? It's like 7,000 bucks. What's 3.5% of 220? It's like 7,000 bucks, right? It's like not much more. So they can overpay, and that's what's happening today. The below the median quality stuff is multiple offers in contract in 48 hours. It's nuts. I've never seen a market like this. Not even 05, 06 was like this. This is nuts today. Interesting. And something I want to circle back to. And Michael, can you help quantify and clarify for all of the listeners who maybe don't know what a jumbo loan is? What yeah. is that's not a loan for a jumbo jet, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. So in the lending world, right, when you're buying a home, there is conventional and jumbo loan. So every city will have a loan limit where a conventional loan in. So let's just pick the Bay Area. I think it's 510 or it's 508. So there is some limit when you are looking to go get a first mortgage, you can't exceed or you're into what's jumbo territory. Jumbo loans are not traditionally backed by the federal government. They are put together by Wall Street and other lending institutions. A conventional loan, which is below that loan limit, it encourages home ownership. It does all these things. There are FHA typically back programs that say, if you meet this criteria, we will buy your loan. We will be the lender of it. So it's easier to get a yes answer. They're the cheapest loans. When you hear you can get a 2.75% 30-year mortgage, it's always FHA conventional they're talking about. So it's just basically what I boil it down to is where's the expensive homes and where's the average home? Average homes are non-jumbo. Expensive homes are jumbo. And oh, by the way, as a landlord, I never buy, none of my properties are jumbo loans don't make great cash flow. It's just like the Monopoly board, right? You don't buy Park Place and Boardwalk as rentals, typically. Oh, I've been doing it wrong this whole time. <laughs> I always buy Park Place. <laughs> Shame Yo, on got, me. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you got deep pockets. <laughs> <laughs> I want to circle back on something you mentioned. We're going to see potentially this flight for some of these major metros, LA, San Francisco, mm, New York. Yeah. A lot of people listening to this, it's called the remote real estate investor. A lot of people are looking to invest outside of California or New Mm -hmm. York. Do you see that meaning secondary markets are going to be more attractive for people? For sure. Like I said, I believe a lot of Californians, I can't speak for New York. I've never lived there, but I actually own a place there. It's where my daughter lives. A lot of us are thinking, you know, for example, I'll just pick on Twitter, right? Twitter was the one that came out and said, live wherever you want forever. We don't care. Right. That's what they said like 30 days ago. So if they keep saying that next year, and I think there's a general belief that they may or may not, if they do, yeah. I mean, California is the most populous state for a reason. And if we lose even 5% of the population that says, I don't want to live in this high tax space with crazy homes, what I'm paying for a studio in San Francisco, four or 5,000 bucks a month rent, I can go buy something in Texas and have a yard and a front yard and all these other things. Yeah, people will make quality of life decisions. And then what's really going to hurt San Francisco, why I'm down on San Francisco for the next decade, is not only are you going to have the exodus, but you're going to have people stop coming. That is what the feedback loop that is the Silicon Valley, right? Computer science engineers come, all the smart people come, they do whatever they do. Some of them win, some of them lose. You know, that's just the history of the Silicon Valley. We're going to stop being attractive because we're going to have companies tell that 22-year-old, 23-year-old, no, stay where you are. 
stay in Nebraska, stay in Utah, stay in Texas, wherever it is, work remotely. So that input is going to turn off and then you're going to have this slow leak of people leaving. And yeah, I'm guessing the Bay Area real estate market sees a, you know, a double digit hit in the next year to 18 months. It's just why live here if you don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. Something kind of taking it to the next step of, yes, we're going to see this mass exodus. Do you now anticipate seeing some of these traditionally investment-friendly markets becoming a lot more competitive now, like what you're experiencing in Fresno? Because now we are going to see maybe new owner-occupants moving into the area. Yeah, you're not only going to see new owner-occupants, you're going to see new owner, new owner-occupants with deep pockets. With money, yeah. Yeah, right? They're going to be you know, like, if you're an owner of anything in the Valley or LA, you could sell it. And you know, if you bought it you know, five years ago or more, you're sitting on a pile of equity. Even if you have to take a small haircut, you're going to still have enough money to pay cash for pretty much anything you want in most of the rest of the country. So yeah, it's going to happen. And my guess is the states with no income tax that are warm weather are probably going to see even more flight from California. So close to us, that means Nevada and Texas, right? If you want to go out to Florida as well. So I think there's going to be a lot of quality of life decisions made in the next 18 months, and California is going to be a net loser, and there'll be some states that are clear winners. I think it's very logical to see how the dominoes go that way. I was just going to agree with you that I think a lot more companies, we're seeing it, right? Like people, companies are being more open to remote, Mm -hmm. and not only once companies realize we can work remotely, be as productive, they can also get away with, you know, if you live in Texas now, they're not going to pay you the same as when you were living in the Bay, right? Like you can afford a good quality of life for less. So I think knowing that, that makes more of like the business case for companies to- Oh yeah. I mean, just think about this, right? You're an engineer, right? And you went to a great college somewhere in the country. You can live where you're currently at for 75 grand a year for what it would take you to live for 150 or 160 K to live in San Francisco. They can hire Mm -hmm. two of them. You don't even have to be as productive and they're going to come out ahead. You're 75% <laughs> of productive. I mean, I mean, let's do the math, right? If you're 75% as productive and you cost half as much, you win. Simple math. That's yeah. so true. <laughs> That's a, good That's a really good it. way to put it. That's a really good way to put it. So, Michael, in your last episode when we had mm-hmm. you on, the main takeaway was single-family homes, still the best way to go for you know the next 10 years or so. Mm-hmm. Has your opinion changed at all as a result of the last couple of months? No, not at all. If anything, it's gotten deeper. I actually see, again, excluding San Francisco, New York, and LA, mm-hmm. I think there's a very good chance that many markets actually see double-digit price increases, right? A lot of that's going to boil down to supply. This is a supply problem. And there are certainly, you could look at the chessboard or dominoes and see a branch that says, hey, these forbearance requests that are out there, you know, double digit unemployment, uh, a lot of that stuff could necessitate more supply next year. You could certainly tie that together. I just don't see it. I see demand so outpacing supply that the little trickle of REOs or foreclosures that may come from forbearances that blow up won't be there. I actually see most of the pain in apartments which is, again, why I think I was negative on multifamily in 19, but that was more just because cap rates got so low. What I'm seeing in 2020 is not only cap rates expanding, which means values come down, I'm seeing economic occupancy. I mean, just look at San Francisco and Mountain View rent last month. Asking rents went down double digits in a month. That's freaking unheard of, right? Economic occupancy is down double digits, right? So multifamily... And what is economic so, occupancy? So occupancy is how many heartbeats you have. Economic occupancies are how many heartbeats are uh, sending you a check. So you can have occupancy at 100, but on economic occupancy at 50, which just means 50% of the people aren't paying you. Right, That's the delta. And, and we're seeing occupancy go down, economic occupancy go down. We're seeing asking rent go down double digits into a rising cap rate. I mean, I did some math the other day where if like rents went down like 5%, economic occupancy went down 5% and cap rates went up a single point, that values fall 30%. Freaking multifamilies are going to get crushed, just crushed. Do you think that'll be everywhere or kind of- No, it'll be, I mean, there'll be exceptions, right? If you're in like a area where it's getting a lot of net migration and you're not high rises, I think any high rise is in trouble. So you're garden style. 
there will obviously be some winners. Just like there are going to be lots of winners in single family, but some clear losers, New York and San Francisco, there will be some winners like Texas again could win because again, you're going to get net migration, no taxes. I think Florida could win. They got a little bit of a problem because of all the service sector and cruise lines and all of that stuff. So it's far easier to see single family winning than multifamily, right? I would say 90% of the country wins single family where maybe 30% of multifamily markets win. Because again, space is good. Everybody remembers the last crisis. In today's space is good. Do you want to live in an 850 square foot, two bedroom, one bath apartment? Or for the same cost, you want to move somewhere else and live in a you know 2,200 square foot single story house? I mean, people are going to make these decisions over and over again. And right now, space is good. Yeah. So it's interesting we talk about you know this projected growth in price for single family homes. I think so many of our listeners, and I know a lot of people within the academy often ask, you know, what do I do? Do I sit and wait and mm. sit on the sidelines or do I go buy now? What are prices going to happen? And of course, nobody knows. Mm. But you're anticipating prices to increase in the single family space. So having mm. invested through the last recession, you know, what advice would you give to a new investor who's just coming to the game now? What do you tell this them? Is, I would tell them, again, I can speak to Fresno, right? right? I would tell a new investor coming to Fresno and I would tell them this is the riskiest time to write offers. Because you're new, you're hungry, you're eager, you want to get a deal. And when you're in that state, you are very likely going to overpay. You are likely going to pay 220 because an owner-occupant bid 219. And you're going to take a deal that I would have paid 170 for, and you're going to pay 221. And you're going to pay 50 grand too much. Yeah. So congratulations, you got a deal. You'll feel good for a week. And then you'll realize you created an alligator, which I write in my book which is negative cash flow. So you need to learn your freaking market. Realize that patience is good. This is the most unusual market I've seen in 20 years. And if I'm saying that, you should take that as a freaking grain of salt because it, it's very easy to make mistakes. So that's what I would tell them. Do your freaking homework. Love it. By the way, we use alligator all the time on the show now. We always give you a shout out. When yeah, we, when we say TM, this, uh, Michael Zuber. <laughs> Thank yes. you. So we always call out alligators and, nice. and give you a shout I appreciate out, by it. The way. That's nice of you. <laughs> so that's what I would tell them. Hopefully that's okay. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. I want to shift gears into something you actually talk about outside of, I mean, it's the ultimate goal of why we do all this, which is financial independence. Mm. And there were some questions I didn't get to ask you in the last episode that I wanted to ask you this Ooh. time. I feel like a lot of us, that's the goal, mm -hmm. right? Like we're trying to build our real estate empire to either semi-retire or have financial independence. Mm -hmm. And take me back to when you actually retired. Like, how did it feel? Do you feel like anything really even changed? Oh. This is something I think about all the time. Like, is anything going to even change? Am I just going to want to keep working? <laughs> like, how did that feel? All right. So let's, so let's see if I can set this up for folks. So first and foremost, it was <laughs> February 1st of 2018. I worked at a place where that was the first day of the fiscal year, right? Because we just finished our year. We were off once. So first day of a new year. I'm 45 at the time. And all along, I'm telling myself I'll retire at 50 because I love my job. I'm having fun. I'm really freaking good at it. And I just, I love my team and all of these things. I go into the office. It's February 1st. I work in sales. So in sales every year, they throw up the desk chairs and you reorganize and you get all these new things and your quota goes up a mile. And <laughs> they had me reporting to an individual that I don't like, respect, or worse, trust. This is not a secret to anyone. He has been at the organization longer than I have, has a bigger list of friends. I find this is happening. I have about 10 minutes to think about it. I do play with in my head the chessboard that says, do I try to circumvent this? play every chip I've built over the last several years and make this something else, I quickly realized that that would probably be successful, but I'll lose the war, right? I'll win the battle and lose the war. So we walk into the meeting, the schmuck starts talking and I'm like, I just can't work with you, right? You're saying all these <laughs> things and I can see the other side of your mouth moving. And I'm like, dude, you don't like me. I don't like you. This is not a secret to anyone. I suggest you create me a package and I will promise not to say anything nasty. That was it. It was a, 10 minute thought. And so I text my wife because again, I went to work excited, right? We just crushed it. We had a great year. I'm excited for the next challenge. Hoorah. Get to the office, figure out blah, 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 blah. I'm like, Ooh, don't think I can do that. Nope. Really can't do that. 
So I text her, <laughs> you know, I'm coming home, I'm done, I'm out. And um, so I spend the next couple of days smiling so hard my face hurt. I don't know if you've ever smiled that hard for that long. I called everybody in my phone. I mean, A to Z, everybody got a phone call. But then problem set in. I'm a type A person. I've been running a thousand miles an hour since I was 12 years old. I've had a job since 12, at least one job. Many times I had two or three. And now it's, you know, Wednesday and then Thursday and then Friday, and I'm still up at 6 a.m., nothing to do. So after about two weeks of this, your mind's dangerous, man. You got to watch out for your mind. I start to go into a depression. I'm 45. I'm financially free. I don't have any crazy wants or needs, so I'm good for the rest of my life. But I'm telling myself for hours a day that I'm a loser and I'm a failure and get off your ass and do something. So I was a weekend away from just getting a job, right? I'm pretty well known in the Valley. I could have gotten a job in another software place easily, but that's when I decided, I said, you know, I got to tell the story of one rental at a time. I'm going to focus on that. And, you know, that was something I suck at writing. It's hard to do. I'm not good at it, but that was going. And then I realized that, you know what? I want to help people, right? I'm okay on the ladder, right? That's where some people struggle is they get to a point where they're financially free, but they want to keep climbing. And if that's you, awesome. That is not me, right? I'm where I'm at. I got a cushion. I'm good. So I want to reach down and pull people up because I came from very, very humble beginnings. I have enough and don't need more. So I had to get, I'm comfortable helping people up. And that's where the YouTube channel grew from. Now nearly 8,000 subscribers, over 2,000 videos. I do four hours of original content every week. And that's been enough for me. But, you know, being financially free at 45 and quitting in a whim, it felt good for a couple of days, but there were two, I've never been a person to see depression, but those two weeks were pretty dark. Your mind's a powerful thing and it could be used for good or bad. So I remember that time frame. It was kind of scary. Yeah, wow. I'm sure. Thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So did you, when you walk into that office, you already knew, like, I'm good. I've already reached where I need to. You just were working because you, you like it. I thoroughly enjoyed what I did. I'd have done my job for free, man. Okay. I'd have done it for free. I just <laughs> love what I did. You're rare. I, <laughs> you're rare. And I feel like a lot of us are like building towards this place where it's like, I can't wait till I go in. And I'm not in that camp. I love Reroot. <laughs> <Right. laughs> I'm not in that camp, but like, like I like what I do marketing and I like what I do, yeah. but it's like, there's a lot of people who are in the camp of like, I cannot wait to hand in my, I'm quitting letter, mm -hmm. but it's cool to hear that you were, you were still like going because you enjoyed it. And then you were in a place where you could change paths whenever you wanted to. I mean, that's amazing. That's an awesome. You thing. know, I probably could. I mean, if we wanted to, I mean, like the earliest we could have been financially free and not suffer any kind of hardships financially with where we were. It probably had been 42 or 43. So a couple of years earlier. So mm. we were fine for a long time, right? But yeah, again, I went to work that day, excited is all get out. Cause again, the best day of the year as somebody who just crushed last year is when you get to go attack the next year. Right. And it didn't end up that way by 10 o'clock. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm done. <laughs> went sideways. Yeah, isn't quick. it funny how your reward for a job well done is more work? Yeah, but I've been on that treadmill for 20 years. So one of my most frequent phrases in sales is we operate 90-day cycles, right? I can get fired every 90 days for lack of performance. And, you know, you do that long enough, you just, you become a callous to it. So it was exciting to me. So many people I talk to, like Emil mentioned, you know, I feel like there's two kind of two types of people working towards financial independence. One is running towards something, mm -hmm. and, you know, whether they like their job, but they think financially being free would be great, or they're running away from something. They mm -hmm. hate their job. They can't wait to be done with it. And for the folks that are running towards something that enjoy their job, I share with this, again, I heard this quote somewhere, but it's dig your well before you're thirsty, there you right? Because for you, if you had said, you know what? I love my job. I never want to retire. Forget this whole investing thing. Why would I bother? I love my job. Yeah. You wouldn't have been able to walk away come that Monday morning. Oh, yeah. oh my God. You know how miserable I would have been? You're so right. If I couldn't have <laughs> known in the back of my head that this idiot talking across the table from me has no idea that I don't need this place. Yeah, that would have... Oh man, that would have sucked. That would have been a, terrible. a shackle. Yeah. Oh, I got to deal with you. Oh, I'm going to hate this every day. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find, Michael, I kind of sticking with the theme of financial independence here that the, we just recorded a podcast the other week with a, a tax professional and he was saying mm. that, you know, someone, people who make hundred grand equally, one from passive, one from earned income, the guy who earns it passive or the person who earns it passively doesn't need to make as much because they're actually going to be taxed less. 
Mm. So for your personal financial independence situation, did you find that you actually didn't need to replace the exact amount you were earning mm-hmm. because of a t- because it was tax advantaged? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I don't know what the exact math is. I'll be close, but yeah, I could probably, you know, bring in 30% less and live just the same because of different tax treatments. Depreciation from a big portfolio hides a lot of top line income. Oh, he's absolutely right. And that's the beauty of real estate. Absolutely. That blew my mind when we did that episode. I had never thought about it. I had thought, okay, here's my income now that, you know, we're at a lifestyle where we like, I need to replace that. Mm. But it's totally different because it's being taxed differently. So you yeah. end up with more of it at the end of the yeah, year. Yeah. I mean, depreciation, right? It's not a real expense, but it shows up on my tax statement every year. And I'm writing off, I didn't look this last year, but it's got to be almost 200 grand in depreciation. That doesn't suck. That's awesome. So yeah, that, that doesn't <laughs> that suck. Does, that does not <laughs> suck. <laughs> I had one last question here. I watch your YouTube channel. I probably watch one or two episodes a oh, week. Wow. And I forget who you were talking to. I think it was a guy named Matt. And you casually kind of slipped in that you're planning in retirement, like full retirement at the end, to like not have any property to sell it off and kind of have all this cash. And I was kind of like shocked. I'm like, yeah, I didn't know that was the well, plan. It's, it's, I'm not sure what the plan is. I remember that video. Basically, so we have a, my wife and I have a daughter and she is in New York, as I think I shared earlier. She has no interest in real estate investing. So as we get closer to the end, it's going to be a choice on what we do. Because one of the things we've always thought about is great. We'll give it all to her, right? You know, or at least most of it. Right. But she's made it yeah. very clear that she wants none of that. So my guess is we will probably sell off well more than half of it later in life, you know, decades from now. We'll probably do some owner financing things such as that so we get fair tax treatment. But she'll probably only end up getting 10 or 20 of the highest class assets just because she doesn't want them. But yeah, that's it's a real possibility. I mean, if you would have asked me two or three years ago, it would have been a totally different answer. But yeah, she's like, yeah, she doesn't want them. She wants nothing to do with them. So we have to figure out something to do. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Michael, is there a point that you foresee where you are only going to go into sell mode if you ever get to there where the buying will mm, stop. Never. Do you ever see that happening for yourself? Never. I don't know. What I what shop I have to till tell you drop. People, yeah, shop till you drop. I mean, <laughs> if I ever got like a health scare that said I had a year left to live or something, yeah, I'd be done. Because I think if your time horizon is longer than five years and you spend the time learning your market, you can't go wrong. If you only had a year left to live, you know, real estate selling costs, cycles, it's possible to make a mistake. So as long as I see myself having five years of life left, and that's the beauty of real estate. It doesn't have to be a young person's game, right? It's not like playing in the NFL or the NBA. I can take the skill set that I have and keep doing it in my market or heaven forbid, get bored and move to another city and start over. I still have the same skill. So yeah, as long as I see myself living five years, I'll at least five years, I'll keep buying. Awesome. And I'm just curious on a personal level. I love these interviews because we get to ask, you know, self-serving questions. Go for Do it. you also have a portfolio invested in the equities market or stock market in zero? 100% Nothing. real estate. Yeah, I would say, gosh, 99.1% real estate and the rest is gold or silver. Awesome. Yeah, the stock market, I wrote a little bit about in the book. I was big in the stock market. I was, you know, there's a lot of people day trading today. Rewind the clock 20 years. I was one of those idiots who were day trading and killing it, <laughs> right? I reported a six-figure profit year on my tax return day trading one year. And then by wow. the tax time of the next year, I'd lost it all and then some because it will eventually turn. There's a famous guy out there now talking about stocks only go up. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, they, they, <laughs> they only go up when there's trillions of dollars being pumped into the market by the Fed. Just wait, buddy. Um, so I've been there. I know what it feels like. Uh, and I've never been back. The casino is real. I mean, who would have guessed Wirecard, a German bank, is a complete fraud with $1.9 billion that was never there. You know, it's not a place for me. No, thank you. Never. Mm-mm. Nope. That guy you're referring to, it's funny because he's like a media person. Yeah. So part of it is like, he's just trying to get eyeballs and attention. But I wonder how many people kind of oh, just are like, yeah, that sounds about right. It's oh, scary. I mean, he is clearly entertaining. I watch him. I actually follow him on Twitter. I think he's hilarious. He talks about the green hammer of death yeah. and all these things. I think he's hilarious. He is funny. But he is inadvertently bringing tens of thousands of 20-year-olds in, tens of thousands of people taking their stimulus checks and gambling. And the worst thing is they're freaking winning. You go gamble at 
the roulette right. table and you hit the number first and you get paid out 12 to one or 18 to one the first time, you are going to freaking stay at that table until you mortgage your house. Cause you're going to remember that feeling the first time. And I don't know when it'll happen. It may go on for another six months, right? But there will be a day and it will be nasty and it will come. And I say this as a person that has six figure scars on my back from when I did it 20 years ago. So I'm not going to be jealous. I mean, I know exactly how they feel. I know what it feels like to go to the craps table and win the first two times. I get it. It's going to hurt. Get that rush of adrenaline. And then you chase it. You chase it because you remember the first time was so easy. Right. Not good. Not good. (laughs) Right. So I'm curious, Michael, what if your daughter is not interested in real estate and you Mm. are strongly adverse to the equities market, what are you advising her to do as far as investment (laughs) income or passive income? I had this battle with my wife when my daughter chose her college degree. So here's the story. She's a senior (laughs) in high school. She tells us that she wants to go get an arts degree, which as you might imagine, what we've just talked about did not sit well with me. I'm like, like, okay, honey. I remember because I think it was Monster was the the, uh, job board at the time. I said, honey, maybe daddy doesn't know. Go to Monster (laughs) and show me what kind of jobs you can get when you get out of school. Because maybe dad doesn't know. So she goes to Monster and she types in some arcane logic or words. And like, I've never seen no searches come back. No searches came back. It was like. (laughs) (laughs) On the internet, nothing. Yeah, nothing. I'm like, honey, this, you know, you're being too specific. Be more general, right? And then she does it again. And I don't remember what they were, but I want to say like $12 an hour jobs or $15 an hour jobs come back. And I'm like, honey, realize that you're asking mom and I to pay 200 grand to get your education right? Which is the cost of her school for four years. I said, I can take you to in and out Burger that's a mile away and they will pay you $18 an hour right now. Yeah. Help me understand. Well, that was a strategic error on my part. She started crying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That did she not go start, according to plan. That did not go well. <laughs> she starts crying. She runs upstairs. My wife goes to see her. I can hear him. Then my wife comes down. I've never seen her this angry. And she gets right up in my face and she's this little, and she starts beating on my chest. My daughter will go wherever she wants. She's not going to be like us. She's going to make do what makes her happy, blah, 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 blah. We haven't worked this hard for all this time. She's going to be happy, not like us, basically. And I'm like, yes, dear. <laughs> I, so I have not figured that out. Basically, I'm convinced my, my daughter's going to get a pile of money when I die, and I'm okay with that. That's my answer to that. I did not do that right. Got it. Got it. Got it. Well, thank you again for sharing. This is getting real personal. This is great. What's that saying? Set it free, and if it's meant to be, they'll come Yeah, back. we'll see. And not yet. I don't know if it applies here. No, but I mean, there's always know. that hope that she, you know, that comes around and she says, well, what? tell me about that real estate thing. But she's 28 now, so mm-hmm. it doesn't come around yet. <laughs> all right let's wrap this one so we usually end episodes we've been doing this thing lately where we kind of just have a random question outside of real mm. estate investing and i just thought of one i wanted to ask you okay. i know you could talk about real estate and personal finance for hours mm-hmm. what outside of those two topics could you talk about with anyone for hours uh so i was very good at running what's called go-to-market strategies for software companies i've repeatedly taken software from zero to 100 million at many different companies once in as short as 30 months. So I'm very good at go-to-market, building sales teams, finding someone's passion, and really leading those kinds of teams. So that's where my passion started, right? Was go-to-market strategy, all of that. So could certainly talk about that equally for hours and have in different speaking engagements. Wow. Do you think that has lended itself well to your investing career, those skills? Not really my investing career, no. But it has (laughs) since I've left work. You got to be comfortable talking as we are. You know, my most valuable college class, which I get asked sometimes, was actually in junior college. It was speech and debate. By far, mm. that one class has made me millions of dollars by getting, because I was an introvert, <laughs> as you, if you can believe that, um, starting college. And it was that class that kind of tried to break me out of my shell. Awesome. Interesting. My, there's a show on HBO called Silicon Valley. Have mm-hmm. you ever seen it? <laughs> I have. It's guys get a total Valley. kick out of it. And I feel like it would be better if you're Ali being in, in, yeah. in Silicon Valley. 
Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it, it's the, and funny when they do the inside jokes, I've lived it long enough. I know exactly what they're talking about. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You're on yeah, the inside. Like, I'm on the inside. Yeah. Is it, it's pretty spot oh, on. Oh yeah. It's remarkably accurate and, and embarrassing all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> i love that show well this was great michael thank you so much for taking the time to come back on uh, you know really really appreciate it anytime guys and we're excited to have you back on soon all right everyone thanks again for tuning in and a big thank you to michael zuber as always such a great guy to talk to and has so much wisdom to share hope you guys got a lot of value out of this one i know michael and i did and we will catch you guys on the next episode happy investing <laughs>